Hey everybody, uh, welcome to another episode of We Read Theory, the podcast where we read theory so you don't have to. Here, wait, I'm... don't say that. I say that after, I say that, it's in the script, no. I say that after the theme Mark, song. can I say it like once? You always get You're to say it. You're gonna say it for you. It's such, I'm, I'm so excited for that tagline, you always get to say it, and I'm always, oh, and right, right, Alex. Right, right, right. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, you can do it, you can do it. Where we read theory so you don't have to, I'm Alex. And I am Mark. The shoe is on the other foot. Ha! Huh. Amazing. Okay. So, fundraiser follow-up, just, just to kick off the episode, just to get this right out of the way. Um, we raised about $200, um, and this is this is assumed because the, uh, the commenting thing, unfortunately, didn't work out like we wanted it to. Um, people forgot to, people look like they forgot to put comments because I saw some $20 donations come through um, right after I posted on uh, Twitter and my Instagram. So, if that was one of you guys, please let me know. Uh, send me the receipt on Twitter at We Read Theory Pod, and I'll be happy to shout you out on the next episode. Uh, so yeah, sorry that didn't work out, and we're gonna definitely come up with a better way to do that next time. But we did have uh, one named donor besides besides both of us. Um, that's Mahir. Shout out to Mahir um, for your generous Thank you so much, Mahir. donation. We love you, and so does the barbershop. Uh, I also, we recently hit a thousand subscribers on this pod, which is kind of a milestone estimated. for us. Yeah, it is estimated. Yeah, big, big milestone though, yeah. Because, yeah, we use Anchor to distribute and they don't give us exact data. So we just um, extrapolate based on uh, Spotify data because they give us number of subscribers and we can see what percentage of our plays come from Spotify. But you guys don't want to hear about all that nerd shit. So I just wanted to give a couple shout outs to people who've been rocking with us for a while now, all like six or seven months. Um, specific shout out to uh, Kef and Oral on Twitter. I hope I pronounced both of those right. Feel free to absolutely roast me in the DMs on Twitter. Um, shout out to uh, Jasper and Cosbos on Twitter. You're always interacting with, with my stuff and making me feel loved, you know, on, on the, the Bird app. Uh, shout out uh, Thinky in the Brain for um finding us on what was a a um a richard wolf meme group which yeah. is very specific but uh i thought that was fucking hilarious um let me think i don't want to forget anybody um harrison oh fucking harrison harrison um and i'm just going with that's, our, that's our real og fan that is our that real is OG boy for so long Harrison always reviews all the episodes um, and it comes in with his thoughts and we, we really appreciate that. So shout out Harrison to, for rocking with us since day one. Yeah. And also thank you to the very nice person who uh, sent us a very nice, very constructive uh, message on the Anchor app directly. Uh, that was really awesome of you. Really appreciated hearing what you had to say. And um yeah, there's you know, some some sweet lo-fi hip hop going on in the background too. It's very tasteful. Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if she put that in there or if or if it was just uh, like a thing that Anchor does. But uh, very nice nonetheless. If Anchor does that, they are very in tune with their audience. Kudos to them. But they should give us subscriber data. I would really like to see to see that. But I digress. All right. Perfect. So, with all the shout outs shouted out, let's talk about the police and why they're bad. Welcome to We Read Theory, the show where I don't say the intro this time because Alex already said it before the theme song played. Got his ass. Uh, <laughs> Last time, we began our discussion of Alex Vitale's The End of Policing, covering the origins of U.S. policing and how it fails to address the problems of school misconduct, mental health, homelessness, and sex work. Today, we're going to finish that discussion by getting into some of the more spectacular dimensions of policing, the drug war, gang suppression, border security, and political policing. And if you haven't listened to the first half of this episode, 
and uh, you're looking to hop right into this, that's totally fine, but you're gonna be missing a lot of good background. So I highly recommend that you give that first one a listen before you come and listen to this one. And when this is done, uh, I want you to delete our podcast from your subscriber box. And I want you to actually go to verso.com, that's V-E-R-S-O.com, and download the ebook of Alex Vitale's End of Policing and actually give it a read because we are leaving a lot of stuff on the cutting room floor here. So highly recommend if, you, if you're if you really looking to um, know your shit about um, the history and the pitfalls of the way that we do policing in this country and why it needs to be defunded and radically changed and uh, almost basically like abolished completely uh, to the degree which it would have to be very a very different kind of thing. Um, and then resubscribe to our podcast. Yeah, and then resubscribe to the podcast after. Thank you, Alex. No worries. We just don't want you to have any distractions while you're reading. Oh, of course. All right, let's get started. The war on drugs, as it exists today, represents the absolute worst the police in the United States have to offer. The drug war itself has, after decades of intense policing, produced no meaningful achievements in combating drug use. Meanwhile, the invasive and draconian methods of policing employed by our law enforcement in attempts to fight the drug war have produced massive harm in their own right. The opioid crisis as it exists today was not brought about by moral failings on the part of drug addicts, but by a push in the 90s to aggressively prescribe opiates like OxyContin as painkillers. This push was spearheaded by Purdue Pharmaceuticals, which advertised their drug as being less addictive than opiates you might find on the street, like heroin. This was, of course, not really the case, and prescriptions were swiftly followed by addictions. Demand now existed for black market opiates, and the black market filled in the gap. However, many of the worst problems associated with the opioid crisis now, such as overdoses and the sharing of needles, resulted not from this addiction crisis, but from the response. The DEA, that's the Drug Enforcement Agency, massively curtailed and controlled the supply of prescription opioids. This crackdown did not as we've come to understand, do anything about the demand that had been created. People who were now addicted to opiates often turned to heroin as a replacement because it was cheaper and easier to get. The problem with heroin is that it often includes unknown additives and is generally taken by injection and can be wildly inconsistent in its strength. This inconsistency in particular is what leads to overdoses most of the time. And that's not just with heroin. The same thing happens with, um, especially I see a lot with ecstasy, um, being uh, mixed with fent or coke yeah. or things like that. It's ridiculous. Test your drugs, listeners, please. Yeah, definitely test your drugs and um, legalize drugs because then at least people who are taking them can know what's in them and maybe not die as often, which is yeah. uh, a good thing. Uh, or if like, you're doing ecstasy <laughs> with Ted Cruz, maybe just let him try some first and see what happens. You know, what's, what's the worst that could happen? He'll, fucking, he'll <laughs> share some more porn on Twitter. I, I'm not going to touch that. So overdoses and the spread of STDs through needle sharing are horrible and inevitable results of heroin use, especially when it occurs in such an unregulated criminal context. The question is not whether or not we actually want to get people to not do heroin as much. We do. The question is, does intensive policing produce this effect in any meaningful way? And the answer to that question is no. This no answer is the same in the case of marijuana, cocaine, and illegal drug use in general. Baltimore police officer Peter Moscos reported that even the most major, I actually believe he's an ex-Baltimore police officer, um, so Peter Moscos reported that even the most major high-profile drug raids only disrupt the flow of drugs in an area for a few hours at most. A 2010 study reported that Although a third of arrests in the city were drug-related, about one in 10 residents had used illicit drugs in the past year. This is a huge number of people, but the fact that the drug war doesn't achieve its stated goals in no way means that the drug war has no effect. In fact, the effects are quite massive. The drug war has exacerbated racial disparity in our justice system to an incomprehensible degree. A 2020 study conducted by the ACLU concluded that black people were more than three and a half times as likely to be arrested for marijuana possession than whites, despite using the drug at basically the same rate. Black people also report being stopped for no discernible reason and searched, both on foot and on the road, at much higher rates than whites. And this isn't just uh, self-reported, no discernible reason. This is stops that result in no tickets, no arrests, no anything like that. 
Um, so stops that are literally turn out to be for no real reason. And black people are also consistently given higher sentences for the same crimes as white offenders with the same priors and like, you know, everything like that. Yeah, that's why um, that's why I feel like the uh, uh, defund the police slogan kind of doesn't go far enough. It's not just the police. It's, um, I don't know, vote in your local elections, um, get a different DA, um, uh, unseat corrupt judges. You know, it, it, go, it, it goes deeper than um, just like the boots on the ground if yeah. you might say but it but but also you know never fucking take those boots off the ground at the same time because as, as we've seen the boots are are the heart and soul of what creates political change oh i meant boots on the ground is in cops fair enough <laughs> yeah keep the keep the sneakers on the ground and like the 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 the, the tennis shoes the I've, I've always can, found the boot leather tastes a lot better mark honestly what <laughs> I fucking <laughs> never, never mind. I'll let you continue. I was I'm about so to make sorry. a Cadet Kelly reference, but then I realized that what is nobody that? these fucking Zoomers that listen to our podcast wouldn't get it anyway. Mark, I'm a you, Zoomer. I was born in ninety seven. You, you don't know what Cadet Kelly is? It's it's sounds... Do you know who Hillary Duff is? Do you know who do you Yeah, know who I know who Hillary is? Duff is. I know Lizzie McGuire. It's a, it's just a classic Hillary Duff flick. Oh. Well she flirts with was the it guy a Disney the Channel original movie? She, f- I think it was a decom. Yeah. Um, Did you sub? Oh my god! I've never heard thing. that. It's a thing. No, nah, I don't think so. But yeah, she so. tries to fl- she tries to flirt with a guy in that movie by um, by um, she's like supposed to be cleaning boots. She's like spit shining, and she holds up a boot to his to his to to like his face, and she goes, "Hey, can you spare me some spit? I'll pay you back later." And then he spits on the boot, and she's like, "Hot." Wow, that's so smooth. I That's guess so smooth. I wish I no. I would fall in love instantly. Uh, anyways, <laughs> <laughs> so um, the drug war. <laughs> drug wars also had negative implications for our right to privacy. The police are supposed to provide probable cause when they stop and search an individual. However. Probable cause is effectively left up to the officer to decide, so the reality is that cops can stop and search whomever they like for whatever reasons and search them. Probably the most famous example of this is the policy of stop and frisk, which occurred in New York City under the mayorship of Michael Bloomberg. In 2012, near the height of stop and frisk, only about 1 in 10 people stopped was found with anything incriminating on their person. Considering this rate is basically the same as the rate of people who reported in Baltimore using illicit drugs, it stands to reason that the police are not really stopping people based on any probable cause, otherwise the rate would be higher. A better explanation for who is stopped and why might be found in racial disparities. In 2012, 87% of those stopped and frisked were black or Latino. But even in our own homes, we're not safe from these flippant violations of our right to privacy. Warrants for no-knock raids, in which the police are authorized to enter your home without your consent or knowledge, and without identifying themselves as police officers, are often provided for extremely flimsy reasons. Quick aside, quick aside, Breonna Taylor's killers are still not arrested. They are still cops. They're not even fucking fired. Yeah. Um, They're not fired? I thought one of them was fired, at least. Um, Preparing to be. Um, Okay. Let me... um, I'm, I'm actually going to go over the Breonna Taylor case specifically in just a couple of seconds. Please do. All right. Um, so, so if a suspected drug deal... Oh, if a suspected sorry, drug sorry, dealer, sorry. 28 minutes ago, as of this, they were fired per CI. Wow. That's crazy. And it is 925 on the night of June, June 23rd. 23rd. So, okay. Um, Fucking pigs. Sorry. <laughs> cut that out. Yeah. I don't like the fuck. Um, so, no knock rates. If a suspected drug dealer used to live at a residence but has since moved out, that residence can still be authorized for a raid regardless of who currently lives there. No knock raids have formed one of the centerpieces of police reform discussion lately, mostly due to the disastrous and, in my opinion, unlawful raid on Breonna Taylor's apartment earlier this year. Breonna Taylor's residence was included on a warrant targeted at Jamarcus Glover, a suspected drug dealer simply because he'd been spotted leaving the residence once with a package. There's nothing illegal about carrying packages out of buildings, and this is an activity that people who are not involved in drug trafficking do all the time. However, 
This was considered valid enough cause to justify a no-knock warrant on her residence. And we all know what happened next. Police entered her apartment late at night without announcing themselves as police officers. Kenneth Walker, Brianna's boyfriend, noticed that someone had entered the apartment and reasonably, in my opinion, assuming that the strangers breaking in posed some danger to Brianna and himself, exercised his Second Amendment right to self-defense. He reportedly fired on police first, who returned fire and shot Miss Taylor nine times in her own bed, killing her. This is a story we've seen repeated over and over, and one that could have been prevented easily if police were not committed to ignoring the rights of Americans to their own privacy for the purpose of searching for drugs anywhere they can. The fact that the drug war does not meaningfully impact the rate of drug use, combined with the fact that the drug enforcement disproportionately affects Black and Latino Americans, is enough to make you wonder whether curbing drug use is actually the goal at all. Perhaps we can solve this problem by looking at the origins of the war on drugs. The war on drugs, in its present form, can be reasonably dated back to Richard Nixon's campaign and administration. Something you notice when you examine the rhetoric of Nixon and his advisors is the way they talk about the drug war in private and in public are very different. The campaign was flush with rhetoric about law and order, and the same kind of broken windows ideology we've been harping on this whole time in part one, and we'll be harping on this entire time through this part as well. However, a diary entry by Nixon's chief of staff, H.R. Haldeman, reveals that the actual purpose of the drug war was to recognize that the problem was the blacks, without appearing to do so. One of the most famous quotes on the origins of the drug war comes from domestic policy advisor John Ehrlichman, who echoed this awareness in an interview with Dan Baum when he said, quote, The Nixon campaign in 1968 and the Nixon White House after that had two enemies, the anti-war left and black people. You understand what I'm saying? We knew we couldn't make it illegal to be either against the war or black, but by getting the public to associate the hippies with marijuana and blacks with heroin, then criminalizing both heavily, we could disrupt those communities. We could arrest their leaders, raid their homes, break up their meetings, and vilify them night after night on the evening news. Did we know we were lying about the drugs? Of course we did." End quote. And this all falls into a larger narrative about the Republican Party following the civil rights movement called the Southern Strategy, in which the Republicans tried to shift their base to Southern whites by appealing to their racism, proposing policies that either disproportionately affected blacks more than whites, or simply allowed the police to use their own discretion and enforce laws in a racist manner without repercussions. The drug war was absolutely essential to this strategy. Some reforms have been attempted to reduce the weight of the drug war on our society, and like those discussed previously, there's been some mild success. Treatment programs may be recommended in place of prison time, which is good. However, just as in the case of homelessness or sex work, these programs remain, or often remain, locked behind police and the justice system. Failure to complete a rehabilitation program carries the threat of incarceration, so the system remains punitive at its core. These programs also have spotty success rates, only about 30% of those who enter treatment finish, and of those who don't, 64% are rearrested in the next three years. This is partially due to the abstinence-based treatment, which, while effective at curbing the use of drugs while the patient is under direct care, result in very high recidivism rates once they're on their own again. What may be more effective than punitive measures are more informal ones. Family and friends may be able to encourage recovery better than the justice system, but this can't happen if criminalization forces addicts to keep their condition out of sight and out of conversation. More formal treatment should be made widely available and not require an arrest before it can be accessed, and the justice system should have nothing to do with it. We should also take steps to reduce the harm that is done to and by addicts, which is currently allowed to proliferate. Needle sharing and overdoses can be significantly reduced through needle exchanges and supervised injection sites, respectively. And, and, and so, just, just to clarify, Needle exchanges are places where uh, someone can take a used needle that they might have used to inject themselves with heroin or something else and exchange it for a new one um, that is clean. So that prevents things like needle sharing and the reuse of needles, which is bad on its own, but needle sharing especially can lead to um, the spread of STDs, especially uh, HIV. Um, and a supervised injection site is just a safe place with some kind of medical professional who can make sure that people uh, who that people who are uh, who are suffering from drug addiction can go to um, you know inject whatever um, 
and with medical supervision um, without worrying that they're going to be arrested. And um, yeah, I mean, these harm reduction measures may make some people uncomfortable and feel like the government is condoning drug use, but these are just feelings and we need to reckon with the reality. There is no evidence that these measures meaningfully increase the use of drugs where they're implemented. Instead, they reduce the harms associated with drug use. And that's a good thing. Yeah, I think it, one, comes down to, do you want to be right and say just drugs are bad, criminalize drug use, or do you want to help? Okay, and I feel like that those are like the, the polarizing two stances. Mm -hmm. And all these things yeah. are helping. And if you listen to any interview with an actual, you know, former drug addict, when they talk about things like needle exchanges and supervised injection sites, they're like, those are the things that are most helpful. Why? Because they saw you as a human with a disease. And when I feel like you're in the grips of an addiction, you're going to see yourself as not deserving of, of anything better. You're always going to be an addict. So just like compassion almost more than anything and understanding that it's, it's not always their fault that they're in this awful place. There's a multitude of reasons for drug addiction, yeah. genetic and what have you. Yeah, at, at the end of the day, I feel like the reason why conservatives always feel like the left is like coming up with all these weird rules that they can never seem to understand or remember or follow consistently uh, is because the rules are really not like, I don't really feel like I'm following rules on a day-to-day -day basis. I feel like I'm acting with empathy and the rules are kind of there for people who don't seem to be able to do that and have to simulate it some way. Like that's what, that's what all the SJW rules are just like about like simulating empathy for other people who are hurting. Yeah, um, I don't, I don't want to limit actually, it. Yeah. Sorry, I don't want to limit it to just conservatives either. I see a lot of this thing from no, yeah, yeah. like rich white liberals as well. And other leftists sometimes, you know. Yeah, certainly, we didn't forget about y'all. No, absolutely not. Yeah, if you're a leftist, you can still suck and we hate you for it. <laughs> <laughs> and you can quote Mark on that. <laughs> we hate okay. people. This podcast is anti-people who suck. The first, the first explicitly anti-people sucking podcast. So, ultimately, the reason why drugs should be broadly legalized and the drug war totally ended has less to do with the drugs themselves, but more to do with the abuses that occur during the drug war as an excuse. Ending the drug war would significantly reduce the ability of police to stop random people on the street or in their cars and search them. It would reduce the ability of police to approve no-knock warrants. It would significantly reduce the number of people who are cycled through our prisons every year and stuck with the felon label, which leaves them vulnerable to all kinds of legal discrimination from employment to voting. The drugs are quite literally only a distraction. It's our freedom that's at stake. And that about does it for the drug war. Um, uh, the next thing we're going to talk about is pretty closely related to the drug war, but um, also kind of its own separate things. And that's, of course, gangs and gang suppression efforts by police. One of the most common charges against police is that they exhibit a harmful us-against-the-world view of society. In no aspect of policing is this more apparent than in the suppression of gang activity. There are a few reasons for this. Gangs represent some of the most organized resistance to police power in the United States. Police units tasked with gang suppression engage in a lot of surveillance and intelligence efforts, which leads to secrecy and insularity, as well as a lack of accountability. Decades of suppression through intimidation and heavy criminalization of gang activity have shown basically no success in actually stopping young men from joining gangs and engaging in gang-related activity. All this produces a popular notion amongst officers that gangs are the result of some essential criminality amongst their members, and that even harsher methods of policing are the only way to combat the problem. According to Vitali, quote, the dynamic between street gangs and the police looks a lot like a war between competing gangs, with each side using constantly increasing terror to try to show who is the toughest, unquote. The problem is that police are not the only ones who understand gangs. In fact, they have some major misconceptions about how gangs work. Gang members are often thought to be hardened lifetime criminals, and crime in neighborhoods with the most gang activity is generally assumed to always be gang-related. Neither of these are the case. Even in neighborhoods where gang affiliation is the highest, the rate amongst young people does not seem to exceed 10 to 15%, and most of these affiliations last for about a year. 
Joining a gang is not a commitment to a life of crime. Rather, simply getting a new job or having a child are some common reasons for ending one's gang affiliation. Police also have misconceptions about gang leadership and organization. While gangs do have members who are more temporary and more careerist, they're not necessarily as vertically organized as the police tend to assume. A lot of suppression involves surveilling and repeatedly arresting high-level gang members in an effort to disrupt and hopefully dissipate the gang. This doesn't work, though, because more prominent gang members often have overlapping and frequently changing roles. They're easily replaced if they're arrested or killed. Gangs are also just more horizontally organized in general than, say, the police, so attacking leaders just isn't going to get you very far. It also doesn't seem to disrupt gang violence, as the most violent aspects of gang activity are usually the work of younger members looking to gain respect rather than established ones whose prominence has already made them the targets of heavy police attention. At their worst, gang suppression tactics take the form of gang injunctions, in which lists are compiled of suspected gang members and all association with them is criminalized. Those who are punished for violating gang injunctions may not even have known that their friend or their brother was on the list and may serve up to six months in prison. At the same time, the underlying reasons why young men are joining gangs remain unaddressed. Getting involved with a gang is not usually the rational decision anyway, and those who do so tend to assume that their lives will be brutal and short regardless of what side of the law they stay on. They instead focus on gaining prestige where they know they can, rather than work towards a future that feels out of reach no matter what. The upshot of these police policies of terror is not the reduction of gang activity or membership in any way. Instead, the image of the police in the communities where these tactics are employed suffers significantly, while gangs appear better by comparison. Two basic models attempt to take the underlying factors of gang activity into account in their fight against gangs in general. These are the Spurgle model and the model of focused deterrence. These do largely the same thing, which is to combine the intensive policing methods we've described earlier, as they already exist, with some mild community policing efforts and some mild social services, such as nonviolent conflict resolution and job training. These models produce some positive results, but only slightly so. Quote, research on these programs does show some meaningful declines in crimes that can last even for years. Overall, though, the results are thin. Most reductions are small, occur in only a few crime categories, and don't last very long, unquote. Furthermore, the fact that these models supplement intensive policing with things like job and conflict resolution training rather than guaranteed employment shows that the broken windows theory is still alive and well in these reform programs, despite its repeated failures to produce meaningful results. The oppressive police tactics also don't go away under these models, so you still have large groups of young men, who are mostly black and Latino, living lives under a presumed criminality, which creates a self-fulfilling prophecy when racial profiling leads to arrest and heavy punishments early in life, cutting them off from future opportunities they might have had otherwise. The reality about gangs and crime in general is that they're principally the result of poverty and racial segregation. Attacking these factors is the key to effectively fighting the problem. A successful wraparound method of community problem solving must do a few things. The first is provide stable jobs that pay a living wage. Most people would prefer a safe and legitimate job and a stable income to gang life. The fact that youths continue to choose the latter is a sign of the criminally low supply of these jobs in the neighborhood they live in. The second thing a wraparound approach must provide is social services for those who may not be able to work for a variety of reasons, such as a past of trauma and abuse, or even just that they're too young. Programs like youth recreation or counseling are not total fixes, but show positive results, especially when they're targeted at those with the greatest needs. The third thing that must be provided are the resources to allow communities to enact restorative justice on their own terms. This is really where that defunding comes in. Many blocks in major cities cost the justice system a million dollars every year just to incarcerate their residents. If a portion of that yearly million was put towards community jobs programs, drug treatment, a mental health, and youth services, the overall criminality of these communities would be attacked at its roots. Communities would also have a better idea of who of those incarcerated would actually pose a serious threat to the safety of others if allowed out of prison than the police would. Representative bodies of community members could be tasked with deciding who of their communities could instead be subject to restorative rather than punitive justice. This may include rebuilding and refurbishing abandoned buildings within the community or participating in youth mentoring programs. Yeah, and I like the thing you said about communities also have a better idea 
of who yeah. who is incarcerated for a good reason, you mm-hmm. know, because it's not the communities policing themselves. It's these, um, dare I say, outside agitators, cops oh, who don't spicy. live. I, I know, so spicy. Uh, cops, cops who don't live there are are policing these neighborhoods, and that doesn't that doesn't strike me as correct or right or even smart. Yeah. Yeah, and although we covered um, how, like, just getting cops from an area to police the area but still be police is not necessarily sufficient, it is definitely better. The core of effective gang suppression or gang prevention is in putting resources in the hands of communities. Police are often not even from the places they work in and have little local knowledge. They bring their own preconceived notions into a community and generally maintain a one-way dialogue with community leaders, telling them what to do and think about gang activity without listening. We put all these resources at the hand of police because we assume they're the only thing that works. But in order for that to be true, it would have to work, and it doesn't. Communities are not only more knowledgeable about their neighborhoods, but also more invested in their neighborhoods' long-term success. And that's gang suppression. The third subject that we're looking to address in this episode is border security, border policing. Arguments over border policing today are completely obfuscated by propaganda. In particular, right-wing administrations, but ultimately the whole American political system over the past decades has attempted with pretty wide success to make the buildup of militarized forces on the border and intensive regulation of who's allowed to cross a simple matter of national sovereignty. In the conservative framework, a nation is defined by its borders, and only through complete control of them does the nation exist in earnest. This is, of course, ludicrous. First of all, there are miles of daylight between the militarized border patrols we see on our own southern border and completely open borders. But further, even open borders do not disassemble the nation in any way. In fact, the United States itself had effectively open borders all the way up until 1882. With 1882, we see the actual motivation behind border policing in general with the Chinese Exclusion Act. Prior to the passage of the act, the U.S. had no formal immigration restrictions. It also had taken in some 200,000 Chinese immigrants who primarily worked on the transcontinental railroads. The Chinese Exclusion Act banned all Chinese immigrants for 10 years and made all Chinese immigrants ineligible for naturalization. It should also be stated that the Geary Act, which was passed just after that 10-year period ended, began another 10-year period of immigration bans, following which the Supreme Court made Chinese immigration permanently illegal in 1902. The ban was only actually lifted in 1943. These acts were explicitly racist, but also reinforced the tried and tested myth that immigrants depress wages, a myth with a long-standing history of dividing white and non-white workers to prevent organization and general strikes. These two prongs, of bigotry and anti-labor are the core of border policing, and really all policing as we've seen and will continue to see, such as in 1903 when anarchists were specifically banned from immigrating to the U.S. This act was primarily enforced against Italians. Later, the Immigration Act of 1924 set quotas for how many people could immigrate to the U.S. from specific countries each year. It was this act that resulted in the creation of the Border Patrol, which hadn't existed until then. The Border Patrol, much like it does today, primarily focused on combating immigration over the U.S.-Mexican border. However, their enforcement was almost solely focused on official crossings. This is because Mexican immigrants provided cheap labor that the Southwest could not function without, so migrant workers continued to cross the border looking for work. The big change was that the crossings were more hazardous, as they were now done in more remote locations. These workers were also now illegal immigrants, who could be deported if they were found out, so they could not meaningfully participate in labor organization. The system was made legitimate through the Bracero program, which issued immigration permits to migrant workers, but left them vulnerable to deportation just the same if they attempted to organize or made any trouble. And while they were guaranteed, you know, some degree of wages and conditions, they were way below what ought to be considered acceptable. Yeah. And that's the thing. People will, people, especially like on the, on the border will hire migrant workers who are undocumented and not there legally, you know, and will one say they're going to pay them after two weeks right like 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 any standard job but then on like the 13th day right the day before they're supposed to get paid they'll call ice on themselves so they don't have to pay the workers Mm -hmm. disgusting yeah yeah and 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 then uh like 
a lot of white workers will like get this idea will like see stuff like that happen and get this idea that like it's the migrant workers who are like causing problems for them when it's like very clearly no you're both workers you're both being victimized by the same system the guy who is hurting both of you it's very obvious in this relationship it's the bosses and another thing i feel like there's i just see all i see all of these um vigilante border patrols as oh well my God. people people i'm doing air quotes right now for everyone who's not on video protecting our borders you know with yeah. their ar-15s um picking up migrants by themselves dude one of the most Why? evil one of the most evil things i see is that is that people will leave out water for yes. um, people who are crossing in like really dangerous uh desert areas which becomes more and more common as the border becomes more heavily policed and, and and a lot of these vigilante groups will just go out and destroy the fucking water stations. And it's like you're just killing people. And 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 hundreds of people die trying to cross the US Mexican border every single year because of how dangerous we, we we choose to make it for absolutely no material gain. Yeah, actually probably less material gain. In my yeah, I mean absolutely. Uh the the Chinese Exclusion Act, for example, was associated with like absolutely no economic benefit whatsoever um because it's not it wasn't their fucking fault that wages were going down yeah um <sighs> so since the old days the border patrol has only gotten beefier the modern extent to which <laughs> why? why did <laughs> and you by have beef... to say beefy <laughs> and, by, and by beefier i mean they look more like beef hot dogs oh my god okay I'll, I'll, I'll let you have this one. <laughs> Do you want me to use a different adjective? Um, beefier. I don't know. More robust. Since if they were coffee, days. they'd go from breakfast blend to Colombian. <laughs> the border patrol has only gotten bigger. No, 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 popping your lips on the pod, Mark. We discussed. Oh God. The modern extent to which the border patrol has attempted to fully close the southern border began in the 90s under the Clinton administration. The ranks of the Border Patrol, which stood at 4,000 in 1992, have been multiplied by a factor of five in the years since. 1996 saw the passage of the Illegal Immigration Reform and Immigration Responsibility Act, which made undocumented immigrants eligible for deportation as punishment for a misdemeanor or felony, but also just generally increased the criminalization of undocumented immigration as a whole. One of the most disturbing aspects of the act is found in section 287G, which states that law enforcement is expected to detain anyone suspected of being undocumented. You may have heard the term sanctuary city. These are cities in which the police have refused to cooperate with this section of the act, citing the desire to maintain trust between officers and the communities they police. The border patrol does its job in an openly racialized manner, frequently stopping people in the border region for searches simply for looking like an immigrant, which of course means being brown. Border Patrol reserves the right to violate your constitutional rights within 100 miles of the border, but often invokes this right at greater distances anyway. And for all these clearly authoritarian powers bestowed upon border police, we have, for the vast majority of Americans, no real positive effects to show for it. Immigration over the southern border has not been meaningfully affected. And just as in 1924, the purpose of border patrolling today is to allow for racialized law enforcement and to stifle organized labor, so the immigrants keep coming. Their situation only becomes more dangerous and insecure. That's not to say that all border policing is totally ineffective at halting immigration. The Chinese Exclusion Act was pretty successful at curbing Chinese immigration, but what does that do for those of us who aren't white supremacists? Even successfully reducing the Chinese population in the U.S. did nothing for people who wanted better wages or a stronger economy. As with every other issue we have previously discussed, the purpose and effect of policing is purely to benefit white supremacy and big business. There's little political will to really improve the situation at the border under the Trump presidency, and frankly, tough on illegal immigration has been as foundational as tough on crime across the whole American political spectrum since that Clinton era. One of the ideas Vitaly illuminates is the return or modernization of the Bracero program. The problem with this is that the original program was designed not for the benefit of the immigrants, but of their employers, who wanted cheap labor without the risk of unionizing. A newer version of this program would have to be much more expansive, as migrant workers today do much more than agricultural work and are thus exposed to a plethora of new and exciting hazards that they would almost certainly receive insufficient protection from. 
the unions themselves have their fair share of problems. Unions have something of a mixed history in the United States. Of course, we can't deny that basically every meaningful worker protection has come as a result of union action. Unions are most successful when they manage to create solidarity across racial lines. But unions often fail to do so, especially when it comes to undocumented workers, because it's believed that excluding them from the workplace will prevent them from being used as scab labor to break strikes. The reality is that this exclusion is what enables the strike breaking in the first place, as workers who are non-white, undocumented or otherwise, have little incentive not to work as scabs when the unions won't take them. And as we've learned time and again, solidarity is most capable of fighting oppression when it is made as broad as possible. There are two meaningful solutions to our problems here. The first requires us to recognize that the problems of immigration are not problems at all. By all accounts, immigrants contribute greatly to our economy and periods of greater immigration have been prosperous ones. The only real argument against immigration is one of culture, which is really just a nice way of saying bigotry. Moving to de-police the border as much as possible, providing amnesty and pathways to citizenship for undocumented immigrants, and making the immigration process safer and easier will by all metrics have a positive effect on the country. The second solution requires us to consider the root cause of all the immigration from Central and South America in particular, you know, in the first place. American foreign policy in these places for decades has been one of regime change and economic imperialism. The coups against democratically elected leaders in Central America as far back as the Carter and Reagan eras, and as recently as the ousting of Evo Morales in Bolivia just last year at the behest of the Organization of American States, and who could forget the greatest coup attempt of all time that happened God, it feels like 20 years ago, but it was probably just like three days. Uh, that like horrible raid uh, on Venezuela. <laughs> oh, where they got uh, only... picked up by fishermen? God, if only all American coup attempts could be that fucking incompetent. I, oh, I've heard of, um. oh shoot, there's another podcast I was just listening to. I forget the guy's name. The but, um no, 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 no. It was um, it was it was a behind the bastards, but I can't remember the guy's actual name. He okay. he he was really old, um, basically rich as fuck. Could have lived the rest whole the rest of his life, but then he tried to start a coup in Equatorial Guinea. I think Equatorial it was. Guinea. I don't want to be wrong, but then he accidentally got too drunk at the airport, uh, with his crew and started a gunfight in the customs office, and then got arrested. That's hilarious. Oh, it's fucking amazing. <laughs> Um, um, okay. Uh, all these coups have been good for the bottom lines of American corporations and disastrous for the citizens of these nations. The extreme poverty, the political corruption, and the prevalence of gangs across the whole region are in large part the results of this imperialist attitude. And I have just, just finish it up nice <laughs> in the script. God damn it. Why am I so lazy? <laughs> It's okay. God, that's bad. Um, we'll just we'll just uh, put in like careless whisper there to just like trend trend yeah. out on a really smooth note. Well, that sounds that seems nicely finished to me. But yeah, do, can we just stop? Can we just can we just stop doing regime change and being imperialist all the time? It's 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 a big problem, and it's, it's fucking exhausting. For us, it's like it's like it's it's causing problems for all these people in these countries that we're doing coups in, but it's also causing problems for us down the line because now now we got all these people immigrating from their countries because we destroyed their countries and it's not like they're coming to destroy our country or anything like that but the fucking fast thing so and they get stronger the fucking the more immigrants come in and it's like and it's like and it's just like how about we just stop that does sound nice <laughs> i don't know what you want me to say to this mark I don't i'm sorry to... i completely agree with you i have no comment <laughs> I know, I know. And now it looks like, and now, and and now Biden is like trying to run to the right. Like apparently Trump is like, is like because he's like really into like his strong dictator types. Like, and and now that Maduro is clearly just like, at at the very least, like a way more competent fucking leader than Juan Guaido, who fucking is like the biggest dipshit in imperialist politics I've ever seen in my life. And so now Trump is, like, trying to cozy up to Maduro so he can, like, look strong. And, like, Biden is, like, running to the right on regime change in Venezuela. Like, it's fucking ridiculous. Really? Wait, I didn't hear about that. Can you... Oh, yeah. Tr- yeah, Biden attacked Trump on Twitter um, for cozying up to Maduro. And he's like, we will support democracy in Venezuela if if we, you know, take the presidency. It's like, 
come on, man. Like, you just oh, need to be big, better than yikes. Trump. It's not that hard. Yeah, really. He's doing everything <laughs> in his power to make me not enjoy voting for him. I don't. It, it, it hurts watching him interact with anybody on Twitter or it's in any interview in general. Yeah. To not look like he has, you know, uh, brain melting disease. Oh, and so, the worst thing, the worst thing. Yeah, I'm sorry. Thing. I'm sorry. Not it's not like it was that big of a surprise, but Bernie has come out against defunding the police. And it was just like the cherry on top of a shit Sunday. That was just this this whole last two weeks. No more Bernie Sanders. Society has progressed past the need for Bernie Sanders. I was going to say it if you didn't. Um, so, <sighs> so, as we've established multiple times over the course of this long journey, the role of the police is primarily one of political control. We've seen how the policing of homelessness is motivated not by a desire to fix the problem, but rather to insulate landlords who raise rents for the sake of profit from the inevitable consequences of doing so. We've seen how a war supposedly waged against drugs has, in reality, been a war waged against the freedom of African Americans in a post-Jim Crow era. And we've seen just how keenly aware of this fact those who started the war were. In our final section, I want to discuss the kinds of police action that lean into the political role of law enforcement the most. We are, of course, already familiar with the deeply political role of the southern slave catchers and northern strike breakers from whom our police emerged in the 19th century. The popular narrative today is that we all have the right to our own opinions, our own political ideologies, and that the police only step in when political action turns to crime. The truth is that the police will often infiltrate and surveil any group with enough members and clout with an ideology that goes sufficiently against the ruling ideologies of the United States, those being capitalism, white supremacy, and imperialism, among other bad ideas. This ideological motivation explains why police action and surveillance is disproportionately levied against left-wing organizations, or even just ideas like we see with anti-fascism these days, than against right-wing ones, even though right-wing orgs are more likely to engage in criminal activity and especially violent terrorism. It also explains why right-wing orgs with a history of violence like the Proud Boys are often coordinated with and treated as allies by the police in suppressing leftist movements, as we've seen in the violent demonstrations in the Pacific Northwest over the past few years and countless times in the past few weeks. It's obviously no mystery that the right is on the side of the police, but the point is that this alliance is one based on shared ideological goals rather than the right's lack of criminality. Bro, the amount of videos that I've seen of cops telling Proud Boys or other, you know, violent right-wing organizations, stay out of here, stay out of there. We're going to be arresting and or kettling yeah. people. We don't want you guys to get involved. Literally, bro, the same people who work forces, not to bring music and lyrics into this pod, but holy shit, it's, it's so, it's, it's depressing. It's so depressing. Yeah. Some of those that work forces are those that burn crosses. Is that the lyric? I think it's like the same who burn crosses, but you got the basic idea. Yeah, yeah. And of course, like historically, we've seen this exact same pattern. Um, those of you who are familiar with the history of like the rise of Nazi Germany will be very familiar with the Spartacist uprising, uh, which was a really, really big union uh, organized strike that was put down by a right wing paramilitary group made mostly up of World War I um, veterans called the Fry Corps, uh, which um was um, this is what people are talking about when they talk about the social democrats um, betraying the communists and siding with the Nazis in uh, in the lead up to like the creation of Nazi Germany and the Fry Corps um, were kind of like the predecessor to the other kinds of like Nazi paramilitary groups that are associated with like the golden age of Nazism like the Waffen SS and stuff like that. Mm. Um, so. One example from American history of police enforcing ideology rather than the law is the Palmer Raids. These were broadly anti-leftist raids uh, led by a General Palmer um, that sought to disrupt labor organization in the United States. They were carried out under the pretense of preventing violent revolution, which would have at least been illegal. However, the first event of the Palmer Raids resulted in the arrest of three anarchists in Buffalo, New York, who had committed no crimes and who had only espoused dedication to peaceful political change through labor organization. 
The subsequent and more famous raids in late 1919 and early 1920 were instead targeted at Italian and Eastern European immigrants who, as we discussed in our section on border policing, could be deported for their political leanings regardless of criminality. The raids across the nation over these months resulted in about 10,000 arrests and over 500 deportations, including that of anarchist writer Emma Goldman, a naturalized American citizen at the time, and probably someone that we should cover on this podcast at some point if we can get around to it. No weapons, besides a handful of pistols, were found, although a few iron balls were trotted out as bombs for the press, uh, which kind of reminds me of that candle that was passed off as a pipe bomb, like, what, last week or something like that? You remember that one? I haven't heard about this. Please oh God! It was like me. it was like um, it was like a picture of of a broken up like white candle that's it still had like the sticker on it that said candle, um, just like in a box and it was like police confiscated confiscated a pipe bomb that was thrown at them by protesters today. Like oh, just like they found um, poisonous steak shack milkshakes that was actually like I don't know construction equipment mm-hmm. like some kind of caulk or paint or something like that. Yeah, like, I could have yeah. drank this. <laughs> Fucking idiots. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Um, and of course, the milkshakes have liquid cement in them, and that's why Andy No has brain damage. Oh my God! If you have, if you want to see Andy No's brain damage in action, look at his profile picture on Twitter. The man made himself look like an anime heartthrob, and it's fucking hilarious. <laughs> he it could not look further from Andy No. He looks, the, oh, he's he's so pudgy in real life. Not that there's anything inherently wrong with that, but you have you are delusional if you think he looks like his profile picture. It's one of it's it's one of the things that gets me through the day. How hilarious that is. <clears throat> but I digress. Yeah. Those who were detained in the raids were subjected to, of course, wildly disproportionate police violence. In the end, the Secretary of Labor threw out over two thousand of the warrants that were used as illegal, and the whole thing was a big PR disaster for Palmer himself, who was hoping to run for the presidency in the next um, election after the Wilson administration ended. But uh, that didn't end up happening. Um, but the deportation stuck, and the disruption of labor organizing was irreversible at that point. A more famous example, especially on the American left, is the FBI's COINTELPRO or Counterintelligence Program. This took place mostly in the 1960s and and sought to disrupt and destroy, if possible, the growing civil rights movement. This was done so through vast surveillance of civil rights activists and leaders without legal justification. The planting of informants within civil rights groups who would not only surveil, but often sow dissent and even encourage criminal activity within the organizations. William O'Neill famously infiltrated the Black Panthers and provided the FBI with the information that ultimately led to the illegal execution of Fred Hampton as he slept in his own bed. Cops just, like, really like shooting black people as they sleep. They also... um, It's like their favorite sport. A tradition where they shoot at uh, Fred Hampton's grave. You can see the grave now. It's riddled with, um, with not not bullet holes holes because it's a giant stone, but indentations. Mm -hmm. It's fucking disgusting. Yeah, yeah, the the grave of Emmett Till or the memorial to Emmett Till had this same problem where people would like drive past it and like shoot at it. Like, oh yeah, it's just a metal sign. I saw that. P- uh, a couple of kids were kicked out of school for that though, which was good. Mm-hmm. At the very least, yeah. Those of you who listen to the dollop may also remember him. Uh, this is this being William O'Neill as the dude who was always trying to build a rocket launcher and get other people to help him build a rocket launcher, which I listened to that story and I'm like, wow, I would have been a really horrible Black Panther because he would have come to me and been like, dude, I'm building a rocket launcher. And I would have been like, dude, that's awesome. Can I help? Um, so I would have, that would have no, no one wanted to help him? <laughs> no, because they were smarter than that. <laughs> I, yeah, I probably would have also been a very dumb Black Panther. So um, the takeaway is that many of the worst criminal offenses by revolutionary groups are often committed by police or police informants to justify more surveillance and police violence down the line. Today, political policing is defined by counterterrorism. Stopping terrorist plots is used as the catch-all justification for surveilling and infiltrating all kinds of political organizations, even though Islamic terrorism has no discernible connection to movements like Occupy Wall Street or, you know, Extinction Rebellion. Quoting Vitaly, quote, NYPD agents collected broad intelligence against activists protesting the Republican National Convention in New York in 2004, including organizers, independent journalists, and well-known organizations with no history of violence. Those who were arrested were subjected to interrogation about their political beliefs, organizational affiliations, and social networks. 
After the New York Civil Liberties Union exposed the practice, the NYPD voluntarily agreed to stop it. However, in 2015, activists arrested as part of the Black Lives Matter movement reported similar standardized political interrogations, unquote. Given the state of things, in a gesture broadly, the type of political policing we are most familiar with these days is less covert, a bit more in your face. This is, of course, the crowd control methods police employ at major protests we've been seeing all over the country. Mine and Alex's favorite police department, the NYPD, employs a strategy for dealing with large protests called command and control. This basically means that the cops set strict guidelines for what the demonstrators are allowed to do and respond to any and all failures to comply with overwhelming force, regardless of how serious the infraction is. The point is to force protesting as a political action into a box where it can be prevented from making anyone in power a bit too uncomfortable. The other method Vitali outlines is the Miami method, which is similar but a bit looser and way more violent. It's generally employed in response to protests that are expected to intentionally break the law in some way, uh, such as just like protesting without a permit um, or something like that. This places less precise restrictions on the protest, but does designate no protest zones and times. We've seen this method in action across the nation through the use of curfews to justify any and all police violence that happens in an arbitrarily decided time of day. This is often employed in conjunction with media coverage designed to preemptively justify the violence by casting protesters in a negative light. Now, a common response to these methods of crowd control is that protests can easily become riots and the police are there to protect people and property. The problem is that these methods do not do this very effectively. Police have constantly showed up to nonviolent protests and begun spraying them with pepper spray, launching tear gas, shooting rubber bullets, all of which tends to elicit violence from the crowd rather than prevent it. Even so, the fact that rioting and looting is being done by some people, justified or not, does not in turn justify the police violating the right of all of us to protest. What we are seeing is not crime prevention, it's political control. Because all policing is ultimately political policing, the best alternatives echo those of every other subject we've touched on. When a problem in this country gets bad enough that people are marching in the streets, burning down police precincts, declaring no cop zones, maybe the response from the powers that be should not be to stamp out and avoid the consequences of their actions. Maybe instead, our political leaders could attempt to actually address the problems being protested. They're the ones with the power to do so. In short, the police do not solve problems for us, the people. They insulate the state and themselves and the capital-owning class from the people and the consequences of squeezing the people drier and drier every year through austerity and deregulation. In conclusion, police reform cannot and will not ever be a sufficient replacement for defunding and reallocating. Better training, new rules, and more oversight are all good things and that are probably going to happen regardless of whether we defund or not. However, we must come to terms with the fact that the police will ignore their training and their rules and that oversight can be just as corrupt as the police themselves. The only way to replace the ineffective policing of our many social ills with efforts to genuinely solve problems is by replacing the police, who were never designed to solve problems for us in the first place, themselves. Yeah, that's why I, I, I really hated seeing all of those, um, well, not, not hate, it was just kind of kind of um, bothered by, because it was like a, a misplaced uh, bit of activism there, you know? They, if, and if, and if um, for the uninitiated, Eight, eight can't wait is like eight reforms people want to uh, institute in different police precincts around the country to prevent yeah. deaths from uh, police violence. You know, uh, de and they're not even de-escalation training or anything like that. But two of them were things like banning chokeholds and banning shooting at um, unidentified moving vehicles or something like that. Like, Which are things that are already banned in certain police districts already, yeah. right? Did you, yeah. Do you think like this these, This was like encouraged before? No, they're going to just do it anyway. This isn't going to do anything. Why? Oh, it's, it's, yeah, it's, 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 it's frustrating trying to reason with people. Yeah. It, yeah. Um, yeah. It's almost like the um, people outside of the movement who are 
who are coming in and co-opting it for their own purposes are actually the fucking moderate liberals, considering that literally, like, the first thing that happened in this protest was that they burned down a police precinct. Like, maybe it's a little bit more radical than, like, banning chokeholds. Yeah, but... Oh. Do you know yeah. how Chaz is doing? I haven't I haven't updated myself. So it's not, it's not Chaz anymore. It's, it's Chop? It's Chop now. Ah. Uh. So Cap Hill organized protest. Chaz... Chaz, so so Cap Hill Autonomous Zone was something that was written in like Sharpie on one of the um, barriers um, that were placed outside of it, and um, it's um, it, it kind of just like became a meme. Like internet leftists, you know, in my opinion, understandably got very excited at the idea of like a real autonomous zone in the United States, and it still kind of is to an extent an autonomous temporary autonomous zone, but at the time um, of this podcast. Yeah, I mean, we'll see, um, but it's really not like this big anarchist project um, the way that people want it to be. It's certainly not a, a communist project as, as a, um, that's like looking to overthrow the United States or anything like that. Um, obviously, it's six blocks in Seattle, uh, but... Um, and it is Seattle, so you can bet some of them are yeah, communists even, or at least leaning that direction. Yes, yeah, some of them for sure, but... Um, my understanding is that even the, the, the cops aren't really totally kicked out of the area. Like they're not like going through like patrolling on beat or anything like that, which is definitely an improvement. But um, when the, it seems to be that when the cops like want to enter, they're generally allowed to do so a little bit without much of a fight. Um, so like, it's not really a temporary autonomous zone in the same way that like, um, that like maybe that, that like the Paris commune, uh, you know, was a temporary autonomous zone. Um, but it's still, you know, um, still fun. So that, that, yeah, I mean, it's, it's fun. Yeah. They're just giving out like free food to homeless it. people and having like an open air market for edibles. Yeah. Which yeah. I don't think is the worst thing in the world, you know? Yeah. If, 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 if you, our lovely listeners, are, are, are interested in knowing a bit more about um, what's going on there specifically, uh, I do recommend you check out an episode of the worst one of the more recent episodes of the worst year ever that goes over the history of temporary autonomous zones and um robert evans who was there on the ground uh, and kind of like walked around talked to a bunch of people saw what was going on um kind of gives an account of what's going on there um and that's basically where i'm getting my understanding of what's going on there from so honestly just go give them a listen it's actually a very interesting episode so uh let's do the plugs if we got nothing else to talk about. Follow us on We Read Theory Pod at We Read Theory Pod on Twitter. Our really only social media. Um, I deleted my Facebook, and Mark doesn't have an Instagram, so we're um, pretty much um, off the grid, as far as, yeah. except except for Twitter. And um, yeah, if you're looking to reach out to us, definitely do it through there. That'd be great. If you're looking to help us out, getting our voices out there. Um, making the podcast as accessible as possible. Uh, we would love it if you would leave us a positive review on Apple Podcasts. We've gotten a few of those, and we appreciate them so, 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 so much. And, you know... Uh, yeah, tell your friends. Put it in Put it in your local meme pages. Um, yeah, not just Richard Wolf meme pages. Slavoj Žižek meme pages will work too. Um, even, even, like, I don't know... Jeremy Corbyn meme pages, I would even be okay with. You know, Honestly, whatever. if you're using our episodes to dunk on conservatives, then put it in whatever meme group you find appropriate. Um, I I might judge you for being in like an uh, Ayn Rand uh, meme yeah. page, no, though, no, unless you're making no, fun of her. No Francis Fukuyama. Yeah, our Dave Rubin on Reddit is actually all leftists just dunking on Dave Rubin for being a fucking idiot. <laughs> I don't hate that. All right, all right. Uh, this episode's already so long. Thank you for tuning in. Yeah, thank you all for listening. Love you guys.